Greetings and salutations. Thanks for checking out the video. We're just going to hang out for a while and talk about some random stuff that I'd like to share. This is the kind of video that usually doesn't get a whole bunch of views. It won't make me any money, but those of you who do watch it, you might get something out of it, possibly. There's an outside chance at least. Got a great comment on a post that I put on Facebook, the Easy Linux Facebook page this morning. Uh, and uh, It's from Philip Hardy. He says that I need to join LA, Linux Anonymous, get my addiction in check before it ruins my life, but he does agree you can never have enough. And the post I put up basically was me talking about the fact that uh, Linux computers are like potato chips. You just can't have one. And I posted it because... What I will do on occasion is I will say in a video or post somewhere on social media something about you know, talking, I might want to change my main machine over to this distribution or that desktop. And then people come back and they say, oh, you're such a distro hopper. You're always hopping. When I used to do a lot of distribution reviews on the channel, every one that I would do, somebody would say that. Would you quit hopping distros? It never occurred to them that I was trying to run a YouTube channel and I was providing content. In other words, we were looking at things. They take it personally like, no, each time I was doing this, I had changed to a new distribution of Linux. So people get that impression. And then people will say things like, uh, on a comment this morning, it was a good-natured comment, by the way, that I had posted on Facebook earlier this week that I was considering maybe switching my main machine over to the Ubuntu Mate flavor of Ubuntu with the Mate desktop. And they said, well, something along the lines of you might want to take that slow. Uh, you might not know it as well as you know Linux Mint because people think that I'm just the Linux Mint guy, but that's not true. I run Ubuntu all the time and have forever always have Ubuntu going and Ubuntu Mate is one of the distributions that is right up there one of my favorites uh, the difference between well I guess the 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 margin between me wanting to run stock Ubuntu 1804 and Ubuntu Mate is very thin I, I kind of go back and forth it's like would I rather be running that one I do it all the time so that's where those comments came from and I have been actually running that since it came out what was that 2014 when it was originally announced by Martin Wimpress and Alan Pope so I've been running it since it's been in beta and worked with the project and talked to those guys all the time so I was kind of giggling at that it was like yeah all right uh, so how do I do all this? I mean, that's the question that needs to be answered, and that's one of the things I talked about in the post, was that I run a lot of virtual machines, and I just rebuilt my virtual machine farm. I was having some issues with VirtualBox 6.06, .06, and so I had to do something uh, we'll talk more about that in just a minute. But what you're looking at here are the four that I have running right now. Uh, we have Linux Mint 18.3. We have Linux Mint 19.1, both with the Cinnamon desktop. We have Ubuntu 18.04 with GNOME, which is also what's running on the main machine here that I do videos from and serves as the host for the VMs. And then we have Ubuntu Mate, and this is the same layout that my brother has set up right now. Uh, he has been running this distribution for quite some time on his old Dell Dimension, and he absolutely loves it. So I've been keeping this version over here just in case he needs some help. Uh, he's pretty hip to Linux and been using it for quite some time, but every now and again he'll call me up with a question. And so I like to keep it running somewhere so that if somebody asks me a question about it I can go check it out and look for the answer and say oh you just go over here and you click that or you do this so that's one of the reasons I run these the other one is just to have them around to keep track of what's going on in the distribution uh, my mom runs Linux Mint 18.3 I have another machine in the house that runs Linux Mint 18.3 so if I ever want to do any testing or figure something out I've got this running here and so that's just the, the virtual machines. 
now I also have other physical computers in the house and I will talk about them in a minute but before we get into that for those of you who are interested uh, I have mentioned in past videos that I have been having trouble with VirtualBox and what I have been doing was I have been running VirtualBox 6.0.6 because it that's the latest one and I've been running that simply because uh, it was supposed to be more stable than the version of VirtualBox that is shipped in the repos for Ubuntu 18.04 uh, they ship 5.2 and of course it's a later version so I have been actually downloading it off of the virtualbox.org site and installing it manually every time that a new version comes out and the big problem that I've been having with that is the fact that it's been very 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 slow I mean all kinds of issues like the more cores you give it in the CPU the slower it runs and stuff like that so I mean it was crazy and I was looking at all kinds of other solutions in the last week or two I checked out KVM that's not gonna work because bridged adapters for internet that's hard to do with KVM I also did not like the way it, it worked. It just uh, talk thought about maybe doing VirtualBox, uh, rather um, VMware. And I used to run VMware a long time ago, but they are a little bit too proprietary for me. And I don't like the installation process on Linux. You basically have to build it. I would much rather have something that I can install from a package and it's been a long time since I used it and I know how to make VirtualBox work and yes I do realize that parts of VirtualBox are also proprietary from Oracle but it's not the same level as it is with VMware VMware is really kind of really walled off but anyway uh, so this was gonna be the way to go there's no way I'm gonna use something like GNOME boxes either because it's just too simplistic for what I need I I want USB support I want to be able to do uh, SSH into these machines um, so let's just pick a random machine here and I was uh, recording this video earlier and I was trying to do it in Ubuntu 1804 with the terminal and it kept crashing so for right now I'm just going to avoid that particular virtual machine and we're going to pick on Ubuntu Mate here. Yeah, Mate. Yeah, that's the way you say that. You can ask Martin Wimpers. You want to giggle at me, that's the way he says it. So he's developed the thing, so I just follow him, and I'm not even going to get into that whole story. But every time I talk about this distribution, somebody's got something to say about it in the comments about how you're supposed to pronounce it. I don't care what you call it. If you run it and like it, that's all that matters to me. Okay. So let's try this. See, when I would do that in Ubuntu 1804, while I was trying to record the first take of this video, it would crash. Crash the virtual machine every time. And when I get done here, we'll see if it does it, right? So, yeah. <laughs> let's make our text a little bigger so everybody can see on those low, resolu low resolution devices. Bleh. All right. So what I have done this time around when I rebuilt my virtual machines uh, was I rolled back to 5.2 this is the version that ships with Ubuntu like I said I thought maybe the 6 series would be more stable but it was very slow so I've rolled back to 5.2 it seems to be working pretty well I haven't run into any major stability issues other than this Ubuntu 1804 machine wanting to be a little funky while I was recording the video earlier uh, other than that it's been it's been very useful I'm giving each machine two processor cores and each one gets four gigabytes of memory and then as far as swap space is concerned Ubuntu automatically created a small swap file there and that's how this works and they're pretty peppy this time around it seems to have solved the speed issue now I've only been running this since like yesterday on 5.2 and so I haven't, uh, I really can't say about the stability thing, but we'll see. So far, so good. And it works for what I need it to do, which is jump in and check things out. Maybe test some software every now and again. I usually take a snapshot of the entire VM and then do what I got to do and roll them back anyway. So if it crashes or breaks, I don't care. I can always fix it. 
And one of the things that I need to have VirtualBox for is because I really like to be able to SSH into uh, machines. And uh, like, let's just go into uh, the host machine here. And you have to do this through a bridged adapter. You can't do this through NAT. So now I am actually logged into the host machine that is recording the video that we're on right now. And I can also use uh, one of my favorite tools is SFTP. And uh, that's the secure FTP server. It works with SSH. And then I have a little shortcut where I just put the last couple of digits of the IP address on the local network and it'll put me right in and uh, well it would help if you did it right right yeah uh, yep I see what I did S F T P N typing and talking and it says for a password here and so now I can actually get files off of the host machine and put files on it and it's the most secure way to do it because it's going out to the it's out on the local network we're not doing this with shared folders or anything like that within the virtual machine it keeps them very well isolated from one another you never know it's a, it's just an extra security issue so that is one of the tools that I really like to use and uh, let's see if Ubuntu crashes before I move on to what I want to talk about next let's just try it okay so what I did before was I opened up a terminal right and then what I wanted to do was I made the f text a little bigger that worked so far we don't have a problem there I can drag it around okay let me and let me see what, what I was trying to do was maximize it it crashed the machine again I don't have control of it why would that do that it did not do that earlier today it's only done that since Maybe it's because I'm recording for some reason. No clue whatsoever. But we'll just jump into a terminal here in that virtual machine. And we will reboot it. Okay, so I'm into what is known as a TTY terminal. This works on your main machine too. If you're new to Linux, uh, there's a keyboard shortcut that you can do this with on pretty much any Linux distribution if you use alternate and control and then you hit the F keys 1 through 8 you will be logged in directly into what is known as a TTY which is short for teletype these are virtual TTYs that are spun up when the machine comes up the desktop usually runs on one of those Ubuntu has been putting their desktop on one I think lately or the uh, desktop manager is on one and then the actual desktop is on two I think uh, used to be seven or eight so it depends on the distribution but you have a bunch of terminals available to you see so like see watch I am signed in now on what what is it number three so let's go to number four and I could sign in here if I wanted to I know this is very difficult for some of you guys to see and I'm um, very sorry about that. Oops, I screwed that up. Because if you're on a low resolution device, you're not seeing crap right now. So what I'll do is, is just so you can see what, I, what I've got on the screen here. Let me go ahead and scale this up. Make it huge. So that's what it looks like. That'll make it a little easier to see. So it tells me that we are on uh, TTY4 right now. We're logged in. Am I on 3 or 4? Where am I? Oh, last login on TTY3, it's telling me. So this is the same thing. I'm, uh, if I would um, log into the host machine with SSH, it'll tell me when the last login is. So we should be able to do that from right here, and you should be able to see it. So let's give that a try, too. So we want to do SSHN, which is my little shortcut. And this is one of the reasons that I tell people don't get too hooked on using the number pad. Guess what? It doesn't work. I have to use the key above that in this particular terminal. 
Certain things don't work in certain terminals, gang. Be aware of that. So now I have logged into the host machine from here. And let's see, is it telling me what my last login is? Uh, yep, it is. It's telling me what the last login is. Where is it? Let's see. Yep, yeah, Tuesday, April the 3rd. Uh, now that's, that's the one we're in. So we need to go down here and look down here and see whether it's giving me the last login. And it's not. So I guess sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. That's interesting. I thought it would. Well, we all learn things, don't we? That's why these videos are fun. We get to meander around, learn stuff. Let's see if Control-L works in a TTY terminal. Yes, it does. And so the only reason that we opened up that TTY terminal in the first place was to reboot or shut down this virtual machine. Right? That's why we're here. So I guess I'm just going to go ahead and power it off because I've already showed the virtual machines. But that's interesting that that's doing that. Wasn't doing it earlier today, but that's okay. It's, you know what? It probably won't do it tomorrow when I reboot the entire computer. <laughs> Running things in virtual machines is always not the most stable thing. Anyway, so there you go. We talked all about virtual machines. I wanted to, I uh, did want to show you here. This is the host machine that we're running everything on. It's a Dell T5400, which is a precision workstation. Uh, Dell had this series of machines where they're kind of a cross between a server and a desktop. So what you got is a server motherboard, but it's in a tower, it's huge, and it has all the inputs and outputs of a desktop and you can use a real graphics card which is usually something that you can never do with a server people say all the time can you convert like a blade server into a desktop you technically could but the problem usually is is like getting graphics cards and stuff like that they're not made to do that sound cards whatever this machine has it all built in so it's very cool and it has 32 gigabytes of ECC RAM which is error correcting RAM that is not the greatest thing in the world for gaming but what I have been told is that this is great for stability because error correcting RAM is always looking to see whether its uh, memory content is, is correct it's double checking itself all the time and that's also known as hardened RAM so it's nice to have that and then this machine has two Intel Xeon processors in it with four cores in each, each Xeon. This, is, this machine's a generation back, by the way. Uh, it's a relatively long in the tooth at this point, but it's still very, very powerful. In its day, it was rocket fast. Now, you can buy a laptop with 64 gigabytes of RAM in it and an i7 processor, but it's still not the same as having the big, robust server hardware because I use this all the time. This is my main deal. So that's what the VMs are running on. And with all the VMs up and running, believe it or not, it takes about 8 gigabytes of space. Even though each VM is allocated 4, the way VirtualBox works is it doesn't take the entire 4 gigabytes of memory each time. It doesn't do it that way. And the processors, you see them going simply because of the fact that I'm recording HD video. That's what they do. So, let's see, what was I going to show you? So, when I rebuilt the virtual machines... One of the things that I did was is that I decided that it was time for them to have their own partition on the drive. Uh, what I had been doing was throwing them in the home directory, which is the kind of the default setup, and dynamically allocating the space, which actually slows things down a little bit. So now I actually let the hypervisor go ahead and allocate the entire size of the drive. So each one of those virtual machines has a 25 gigabyte drive and it's 25 gigabytes on the host drive. It's just set aside. That way it's not trying to dynamically allocate and grow the drive as it goes along. And then I'm not tempted to go shrink them all the time, which is something that I was always doing. So I was always fooling with that. This way, I just leave it be. So we have three partitions here. We've got a home partition, and then we've got the VM partition with the four VMs in it, 25 gigs each. And then we have a backup partition at the very end, which is holding time shift snapshots of the operating system that's one of the ways that I was testing all of those uh, different VM solutions was running uh, time shift <laughs> and 
restoring the machine. I usually end up reloading my machine about once a month for some reason anyway. Uh, but that's how I was doing it. So another way to look at it here, you can see the mount points. So this machine has two hard drives in it. It has a 64 gigabyte SanDisk for the operating system itself. So it has uh, the root, it's we call it the root partition. And then we have a swap space on that drive. Yes, I do know Ubuntu creates a swap file these days. And usually for things like laptops, that's fine with me. I've got no problems with that. But on this machine, uh, there's a couple of reasons why I wanted to go ahead and just pre-allocate the space. Number one, it makes doing time shift snapshots a lot quicker. Uh, they, because what, what uh, time shift will do is it will back up your swap file. So that's one of the reasons that you might see if you're using time shift, you see your snapshots are taking up a lot of space. If you have a two gigabyte swap file and it's backing it up every time it creates a snapshot, guess what? That adds up. So that's one of the reasons. The other reason is just because I, I tend to be kind of old school and I think that maybe having a separate swap partition might be a little bit more robust. Uh, Yes, I have 32 gigabytes of RAM in this machine. Some people would argue that you don't need any swap space at all. Every kernel developer that I have ever talked to says you need to have some swap space, even if it's just a little bit, for the kernel to do its thing. And also, there are certain programs that you run that actually use the swap space independently of the kernel. I think LibreOffice does that, or at least I've been told. So if it isn't there, then that might introduce some instability into the system. I'm all about stable, gang. I'm all about, I want this thing to keep running. You know, it's been very good to me with Ubuntu 18.04 on it. And the predecessor of this, which was another one of these uh, pedestal server kind of workstation machines, was, uh, it was a T3500, and it was the same way. So then we have the data drive, which is a one terabyte Western Digital Caviar Black. I have a whole stack of those in a cabinet that I can choose from. So if this one dies, I'll just pop another one in. Somebody was kind enough to give me a box of those. <laughs> and uh, we have the three partitions on here. So we have the home directory, and we have VMs right there, and then we have the backup. And that's the current setup that I'm running. So that's this machine and its VMs, right? So let us keep talking here and this is when we get into the whole addiction thing yes so right now these are the physical machines that I am using in the house we've got the T3500 which is this one that uh, we were talking about there is a Dell studio laptop that this is the one that the kids use all the time it's getting a little long in the tooth it has a core duo processor in it four gigabytes of RAM and it's really getting to a place where, it, like, my son's games won't run as he can't really play some things that he'd like to. Uh, but fortunately, uh, this machine is going to be replaced very soon. Uh, the other machine that we have here is a Pavilion G6. This is a really nice machine. It's got an i3 Intel processor in it. Uh, it's got built-in Intel graphics, which work really well for it, and then it has uh, 8 gigabytes of RAM. And I just went and found some publicity shots of them. This is my actual machine right here. And in the background, you will see my classic 2004 Emerson television that actually is still running. <laughs> That's getting replaced very soon, too. That's been a running joke. We had a lightning strike hit. I had a really nice, big Hitachi HD TV, this big layout. We had a lightning strike hit and it blew up every piece of electronics in the house. This has been several years ago now and we I pulled this TV out of storage and plugged it in and nobody really watches TV around here. Uh, but yeah, that's that's about getting ready to go. Uh, so these are the, the physical local machines and coming up very soon here I'm going to be adding more to the herd. Uh, there was a particular viewer who was very kind, contacted me a couple of days ago and said that he had some extra machines. He picked up a bunch at auction and would I like to have some? He said he's gotten a lot out of the videos on the channel 
And I said, sure. So he's sending me uh, three computers, actually. One of them is a Dell Octiplex, which I am immediately going to take over to my mom's house and upgrade her setup. She's got a really old single-core Celeron machine that is one of those small form-factor desktop Inspirons that were popular about 10 years ago. You used to see them in businesses all the time. Well, she's got one of those, and... Uh, it does what she needs it to do. She's running Linux Mint 18.3 on it, but of course, being a single core system and the maximum RAM you can put in it is four gigabytes, uh, it's pretty much running at the limit the entire time that it's on. And she's not a minimal computer user. She does a lot of genealogy stuff. So I've been kind of looking for a machine that I could just slide in there. In other words, I can take the hard drive out of that one and then I can put the hard drive back into this machine, plug all her monitors and speakers and everything, keyboard back in, and she won't know the difference. It'll just be faster. So, been looking for that, so thank you very much. Uh, the fellow who is sending me these computers, I, I didn't get permission to give his name, so we're going to call him Jeremy C., not to be confused with Jeremy O'Connell, who works with uh, Easy Linux and pro provides the engineering for the website. And if you want to lear learn more about Jeremy, you can always go to easylinux.com and you can click on the link below to CyberWeb Solutions. And there you go. I had to give Jeremy a plug there just simply because I used the name Jeremy. Now, this is another guy. And then he's going to send me a couple of laptops. And one of them, they're both Asus, and one of them is going to be pretty beefy. And I'm thinking that that is going to be the replacement for this machine. Um, and then this machine will probably go off wherever computers go after you send them to the recycler just simply because of the fact that I'm getting to a place where I, I really don't want to deal with core duos anymore the technology has kind of moved on I mean I know a lot of people use them right now they're still up and running and if they work for you that's great but I kinda of don't want to have them hanging around because it's getting to the place where a lot of the software that we're using is so multi-threaded that even having just two cores slows things down and uh, the other one that he's going to send me, I'm kind of looking forward to, is a netbook. It's a little Asus uh, netbook. Uh, I went on a trip, I don't know, about a month or two ago. And I got to a place where I was sitting in the hotel room and I was bored out of my mind. You know that feeling when you're on a trip and you've already been to dinner and I'm not a bar person. We're not bar people, so we weren't going to go hang out at a bar or anything like that. And I was thinking to myself, if you had a laptop, you could hook up to the hotel Wi-Fi and you could be talking to your YouTube friends and your Easy Linux community and you could be posting videos maybe evening and, and giving updates on stuff. And, and I thought, well, that's kind of silly. So uh, the other laptop is going to turn into my little portable machine that I can do stuff that, like that with. Because these two laptops, you know, this one is Cindy's and this one is the kid's. And yes, I have accounts on those machines. And if this machine should just quit working one day, then I can kick somebody off this one or this one. And then I have access to my life because I do keep them all synced up so that all the accounts are the same. So yeah, gang, uh, I guess I do have a Linux addiction, huh? But it's great that I can be addicted to Linux this way. It's, it's wonderful because... These are used machines. I think hard. This one, somebody. This one was something. The one that somebody gave me flat out. Said you can just have this. Not an easy Linux viewer, but I'm always, you know, I always tell people, hey, if you got anything, let me know. And this was one that was just given to me. And this one I bought for a hundred and seventy-five dollars off of eBay refurbed. That was. I don't know. How long has this machine been running? Well, it's been running long enough that the first thing I installed in it was Linux Mint 17.3. And it's just been upgraded for like three or four years with no issues. You know, people ask me all the time, why don't you use Arch Linux? I'll tell you why I don't use it. Because I don't like things that break itself. <laughs> I like things that are stable. And Linux Mint and Ubuntu, damn it, it's stable. <laughs> Very seldom has major issues. This machine is run just flawlessly forever. And it's got a beautiful screen on it. It's great for watching videos and stuff like that, believe it or not. Even though it's just a core duo with four gigabytes of RAM. And that's what kids do anyway. They watch a lot of YouTube. And you know, my daughter logs into this one occasionally to play around on the internet. 
you know, most of the time they're using tablets and phones, but they don't really have a need for a computer. They use it for school, too. So it's worked out quite well. And I've done all this for cheap. Now, I did pay $300 for this machine, the, the T5400. Um, but it came really well equipped with 32 gigabytes of RAM and the two Xeon processors. I figured it was worth it. So I did do that. So do I have an addiction? I guess maybe so. But hey, it's one of the great things about Linux. I didn't pay a licensing fee on any of this stuff. I can put any distribution on here I want to. So we've got three physical machines and four virtual machines plus machines that I support. So what is that? 10, 15 installs of Linux we're talking about? You know, people that I directly help in the family and things like that? Didn't cost a thing. You know, absolutely wonderful. I do try and contribute back whenever I can. But it's not like you have to have X amount of money and you have to pull out a credit card and you have to hand it to them. So to me, I think that's the coolest thing about Linux. It gives you total control. It doesn't hide anything from you. And you don't have to give it money up front to make it work. You don't have to put a coin in the slot to make it go. Like I said, it's good to donate to projects. They certainly could use the monetary support. But you don't have to to get into it. You can learn it for free. Everything's available online. It's just awesome to me. So there you go. Uh, a couple more things to talk about before we wrap this thing up. Uh, first of all, I will not be switching my desktop to Ubuntu Mate. I just have really enjoyed the workflow of GNOME, especially the way Ubuntu spins it. Uh, you know, they make it sort of like the old Unity desktop, which I actually kind of had a love-hate relationship with. I liked Unity in a lot of ways. So it works a bit like that. I'm really used to, like, the old Unity launcher and how that worked. But then you get the ability to, you know, to do like what we're doing here, where we have the the activities mode. And, and I like being able to just type things in and find what I need. You know, like the feedback slide. I'll be using that in a minute. So there it goes. I just pulled it up. Uh, that's one thing I did want to show you if you're interested for the this is like for those of you who are interested kind of thing is that if you are having problems with VirtualBox that you have downloaded from VirtualBox.org and a lot of people are right now if you're on a later version or for some reason your crap's not working and you happen to be on Ubuntu 18.04 and this you're going to have to double check whether this works on Linux Mint 19. I don't know. I haven't really tried to do this. Just look at your versioning if you are doing that, I guess. Uh, uh, never mind. You can try it on Linux Mint, but I can't predict your results. Let's put it that way. I know what the deal is with Ubuntu. So you can, let's just use the old show program here. And we will go to, uh, what, did, what did I call it? I called it VBox. Right. So basically what we have here are the commands that you'll need to make this work. And uh, you need to install three packages. So the first thing you do is sudo, at, first of all, remove whatever version of VirtualBox that you have. Completely purge it off the system as best you can. And then you can just install VirtualBox. That's one package. VirtualBox guest additions ISO and VirtualBox ext pack this will give you the full virtual box suite with the extension pack and uh, you can install the guest additions into your virtual machines directly from the inserted uh, virtual cd that they have and that will do that and the next thing you need to do if you haven't been running virtual box and you're trying it out for the first time then you need to make sure that you add yourself to the proper group and in ubuntu the way you do that is you have to run a terminal command. I have to do it as an administrator. So it's sudo add user, all one word, your username. In this case, I'm Joe. And then you want to be added to a group called VBox Users. That's after you install VirtualBox. Reboot the machine, and then you can open up VirtualBox, and you can start building your own virtual machines. It's really quite that simple. So I wanted to show you that. One more thing to talk about here before we, we end up and, and just, uh, you know, give up entirely here. Well, why don't you do it the right way? With show, you just hit any key, and then it resets the terminal. Okay. 
It's like with HTOP, you know. I see people do this all the time, so I don't feel so bad. I'll have HTOP running, and then I will go, hmm, I'm going to close the terminal. No, that's not how you get out of that. You can just hit Q. <laughs> but anyway. The last video I posted was the one about creating dev packages. I had a lot of really great response from that video, and I appreciate that. I didn't know how that one was going to fly. I didn't know whether people were actually going to like it or not. But it seemed to go pretty well. And the only thing about it was is that the audio level was a little bit low in that video. I apologize for that. I think I had something switched wrong on my audio setup on my microphone, and that may have caused that. Also, I have been playing around with YouTube's new editor that they have uh, for you the new YouTube Studio beta. I've been participating in that beta, and I've been playing around with that editor, which is really nice. I don't like running video editors on my machine. Usually these videos are pretty much live. I mean, I can pause them and pick up, but if I have to go back and re-edit them, it, it just takes too long for me. So I don't really run video editing software. But they do have this thing on YouTube now where they they had a pretty decent editor before, but this one's a little bit more stripped down. They're, I guess they're going to add features, but it's really good at like cutting out stupid stuff that I say. Like I actually posted a couple of videos where I got dates wrong. I'm terrible with dates. And I said, uh, you know, I went to say 2019. I said 2014. Well, I could excise that right out. So in the last video that I used, I, I actually used that editor, and I don't know whether it fools around with the sound or not. We'll see. Uh, I don't think so. But that's a very cool feature that uh, YouTube has added. So if you're a creator out there and you've been putting off checking out YouTube Studio, I suggest you do it. It's really awesome. I've been participating in the beta for a while. I told you this video was just going to have a lot of random information in it. <laughs> it is what it is, you know. So I will give you some updates, gang, when I start building all these systems. You never know. And as far as hardware is concerned, I don't really solicit people to send it to me. A lot of people, they offer it. And a lot of times I turn it down. Um, like, I have no use for servers. People say, hey, I've got a bunch of servers. Would you like to have some? No. Um, I really don't have any use for that. And like I said, I'm avoiding core, du core duo machines and single core process that's those are starting to get where they're kind of fun to run if you want to prove a point but if you want to use them on a daily basis to get anything done the software yeah it's getting bigger even in linux it's getting bloated so um you know multi-core processors got to be had that sort of thing uh so yeah uh, if you got something great but you know keep in mind that i might not automatically take it i guess that's the best way to put it so uh, thank you to people who have offered. I've, I've taken, I've had some people send me some nice things. We've done some giveaways before. I haven't done that in a long, long time. Uh, maybe if somebody comes along with a nice machine, we may just build it up and give it away again, too. That's, that's a possibility in the future. Anyway, your feedback is always welcome, as usual. You can check out easylinux.com for more about Linux. And you can also check out EasyTalk. That is our forum. It's free, secure, and fun. And please be sure to give Easy Linux a like on Facebook if you are a Facebook user. You will find that the, all of the links on your screen are in the description for this video. And I'm done rambling on. And if you've hung around this long, thank you very much. I certainly do appreciate it. If you liked what you heard here and saw, give the video a like. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so. It would certainly help me out an awful lot and I would certainly appreciate it. So we'll do it again soon. Bye bye.